Okay, we'll get started. And good morning. Wake up. Good morning. That's better. Okay. Like to have good response so that I know that you're awake. All right. So we talked about um, different ways of um, that we can get immunized naturally or artificially and passively or actively. Passively means that uh, somebody else did all the work and we get the benefit. Mom cooks dinner and we go and eat. Um, we don't have to do any work. On the other hand, with the, when the, we're talking about actively acquired, that, that means that uh, our own lymphocytes, our own T cells and B cells have got to get to work. And we gave the examples of um, different uh, modes of getting immunized. And uh, we talked about um, passive, uh, natural, that's the best example is, of course, clostrum and the uh, fetal transfer, transplacental transfer, and that's, most, uh, that's only IgG, and in particular some of the classes of IgG that Dr. Mayer talked about, and um, clostrum, of course, IgA. Um, then the artificial passive immunization is when we inject antibodies produced in other animals or human beings, pool gamma globulins, gamma globulin treatment in immunodeficiencies, or tetanus immunization using human gamma globulin, or antibodies produced in horses, or mostly horses, because they are large animals and give lots of antibodies. And um, that is when we are in need of antibodies against certain venoms. There are complications of that, and we'll talk about it in hypersensitivity sections. You'll do some of it, actually, you'll talk about um, a great deal in um, your POPs exercise as well. And what, I'll just explain it, what the complications are, um, in a minute when we come to the, other, the examples of it. Okay, and then active immunization, naturally, is, of course, exposure to the environmental pathogen. Pathogens in the environment. Hospital environment is the best one. Uh, people who work in labs with certain viruses, they don't get infected, but they sort of aerosolize virus or contact, even if they are careful, um, does sensitize them, does immunize them. Then they produce antibodies. Subclinical infections or very mild infections. As a matter of fact, some of the immunizations are mild infections. Um, so that, that's a natural um, way of um, uh, active immunization. And artificial are, of course, all the vaccines. Okay, those are the uh, different ways. Now, we go on to what are the advantages and disadvantages of um, um, natural, uh, of um, Immunization. Well, these are just examples, okay? We're just, just a reiteration of examples. So uh, I'll just skip over those. And uh, passive immunization, again, example, diphtheria, tetanus, human horse, prophylactic, and therapeutic as well. Uh, it can be used. Uh, uh, varicella zoster in human immunodeficiencies. Antibodies are used uh, for immunizing. Gas gangrene, botulism, snake bites, uh, scorpion sting. Those are the situations where there is artificial passive um, immunization. Um, okay. Um, rabies, post exposure again. Gamma globulin is given. Um, hypogamma globulinemias, human. Um, anti uh, immunoglobulin, gamma globulin from pooled human sera are used for treating uh, immunodeficient patients. And we'll touch on it again when we talk about, uh, talk about immunodeficiencies. Okay. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Now, that we have got to um, really dwell upon. Best advantage of passive immunization is, of course, immediate protection. 
And it is used in situations where there is an imminent danger. There is no time for us to wait for our own body to produce antibodies. Okay? In the case, like uh, snake bite, well, within hours you've got to be protected. Tetanus. A small number of organisms can produce enough toxin to kill the infected person before the body can respond to. So you will see in your POPs exercise emphasis that even infections where the window period between the, the onset of symptoms and threat of fatality, serious injury, is short, too short for the body to produce an immune response. And that's where it is necessary to have passive immunization. So the best advantage is immediate protection. What is the disadvantage? Of course, it's not a, an answer for long-term protection. There is no sensitization, immunization, memory production, memory induction by passive immunization. Antibody wanes as the half-life of the, uh, the, these immunoglobulins. Some are shorter than, uh, some are short, some are as long as a month or so. Um, but they ultimately wane. Uh, and there is no um, memory, recall memory for subsequent exposure. Okay? Um, the other disadvantage is, of course, a reaction to the protein that you are injecting into the body. With a human gamma globulin, it's not such a problem because they are very similar in other human beings. So we don't mount a vigorous immune response. However, in situations where horse or any other species gamma globulin is used, you're using a large amount of protein. So if you remember Dr. Mayer's lecture, there is, uh, after immunization or injection with any foreign antigen, there is a the equilibration period, catabolism, immune response, and immune elimination period. And during that immune elimination period, there is a lot of uh, existing foreign protein, and the antibodies are being produced, so they are making immune complexes. That's what is called immune complexes. And since they are in antigen excess, initially, they're soluble immune complexes. If you remember his um, curve of um, proportion of antigen and antibody, antigen excess, they are soluble immune complexes. Um, so there is a lot of soluble immune complexes. And these soluble immune complexes cause a symptomatic syndrome that is referred to as serum sickness. That's characterized by a rash, joint pains, um, erythema, and sometimes serious anaphylactic shock. Okay? So, and that is only when it's horse Horses, I told you, are the most common species to be used as source of antibody. Horse antibodies, uh, gamma globulins, are used for passive immunization. You have a question? Yeah. No, no, this is not anti-antibody. Oh, well, you could say anti-antibodies. Yes, okay. Anti-immunoglobulin. Antibodies against horse immunoglobulins, which are antibodies. Okay. Okay, yes, you could say anti-antibodies. But those are not purified. One doesn't use purified antibodies. One uses whole gamma globulin. So while one or two or 10% of that gamma globulin is specific antibodies to tetanus, if you are using it for tetanus immunization, 90% is other, 90% is other immunoglobulins, gamma globulins, okay? So there's a large amount of protein that is entering, foreign protein that is entering the body. Okay? Any other questions? So those are the complications, and you will see that if, you know, listed in your um, handout. Now, I make the point, especially because there, there are, maybe you may come across situations where no human serum is available. And in that case, you have got to use 
the best available, meaning foreign parts of, uh, you know, antibodies from other species. Okay? So, serum sickness is the problem. Risk of hepatitis and AIDS. Uh, yes, they are screened before human um, immunoglobulins. They are screened for those, but there's still a certain degree of risk if that screening is imperfect or it, it uh, sneaks through this screening process. So there is some danger. And in the cells, I did tell you that cells can also be used, and they are being used in certain situations for passive immunization, particularly T cells. There, there is a danger of graft-versus-host disease if there, that T cell inoculation is accepted. Okay? And we have already talked about graft-versus-host disease. Okay, so those are the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, okay, um, now we're, to go, we're going to talk about um, more, a little bit more in detail about active immunization. Uh, um, exposure to subclinical, natural is exposure to subclinical infections. I've already explained it enough. Uh, and artificial is? Attenuated organism. What does attenuation mean? Attenuation means tempering it down. In other words, they are pathogenic, but they have been subjected to certain procedures that makes them much less pathogenic. I'll give you one example, and when Dr. Hunt comes, and she will, you'll understand a little, a lot more um, when she talks about viruses. Um, Attenuated viruses are used for immunization against viral infections. What one does, viruses, they infect humans by attaching to their receptors on cells. They attach to receptors and then go in. Well, these viruses are passage through animals so that they are more binding to animal viruses and much less to human viruses, and they are adapted to that condition, and therefore they are not as pathogenic in humans. So that is what attenuated viral vaccine is. And a lot of vaccines that we use for human, uh, in humans are grown in either cell cultures of other species or they are passaged through other animals. So attenuated organism. Then they are killed organisms a number of viruses we cannot use as live organisms. We use killed organisms. And um, influenza virus is one example of such a vaccine. Uh, then there are subcellular fragments. Uh, Pertussis vaccine is an example that we take some of the bacterial components and use that in the vaccine preparation. And there are toxins. Well, toxins, example is tetanus or diphtheria or um, um, it'll come back. I'll come back to it, okay? I get um, senior moments sometimes. Okay, so tetanus is the best example. We don't use toxin because toxin the amount that is required to induce an immune response, and if you remember, Dr. Mayer emphasized, there is a certain dose you have to use for the body to respond. There's a certain threshold of foreign proteins or foreign antigens that, you, that is optimal for responding. Well, if you use that much toxin, you're going to kill the patient before they're immunized. So what one uses is modified toxin called toxoid, toxin-like, okay? And there are others, and we'll mention others later on, like um, um, <clears throat> a DNA vaccine, anti-idiotype vaccine. Um, among the subcellular fragments or others, so you, they can fit in both, are the cloned vaccines. There are certain proteins that are cloned into other vectors and those proteins are produced by those vectors, 
and um, then used as vaccine. And um, hepatitis vaccine is one of them. You've all had that hepatitis vaccine, right? And that's uh, um, cloned viral protein in um, yeast. Okay? So that's the, uh, another example of um, others or subcellular fragments. Okay, the examples of live attenuated are polio. However, it is not used anymore in this country. There are some countries it's still used. The oral little sugar tablet that used to be used in this country, but now we have resorted to um, kill virus. <clears throat> uh, measles, mumps, and rubella are all live vaccines, live attenuated. Uh, zoster, varicella zoster, or chicken um, pox vaccine. Um, okay. Um, hepatitis A vaccine. Um, yellow fever. Another one. And um, hepatitis A, until last year, it was given only in certain areas, certain situations, but this year the recommendations of the Pediatric um, Association and the uh, CDC is that it is a part of the routine schedule now. Um, yellow fever, only military personnel and people who are traveling to those areas, it is used in those areas. Um, influenza um, is live attenuated as well as kill. I told you that the example of uh, influenza, a kill vaccine. People like um, me and Dr. Mayer don't qualify for that. We're too old for it. Uh, but you guys, it's a nasal preparation, that nasal spray that can be used in children, uh, in people from 5 to 49 at the moment. I see no reason. Sooner or later, it will probably open up to others as well. And that's live attenuated or live modified. Yes. I'm sorry? Okay. Um, the comment was that um, uh, it was, you know, it, could, it is only for the elderly. Um, influenza virus is now part of the recommendations, and if, depending on which group you are immunizing. Of course, preference is given to elderly and those at risk if the supplies are at low level. Okay? But they are recommending for the children as well as other age groups as well. Okay? Um, the live vaccine is only for five, 4 to 49. Okay? The elderly and younger ones, they, they will get the, the uh, kill vaccine. Okay. Tuberculosis is the only example of bacterial vaccine that is not used in this country, and the reason for that is there is controversy as to how protective it is. Remember, one has to weigh benefit versus harmful effects. Well, the pro for the tuberculosis vaccine, which is used in Europe, in many countries in Europe, and many countries in Asia. Uh, yes. Um, in Asia, and they feel that they have beneficial effect. We do not use because, at least in the past, the incidence of tuberculosis, active tuberculosis was low, and tuberculin test was used to diagnose or used as an indicator of exposure to TB organism. Okay? And that was a good test, good, good um, um, test for that purpose. And if you immunize with tuberculous um, organisms, then everybody becomes positive. I'm positive. Most people who come from Eastern European countries are positive. As a matter of fact, it poses certain problems. When I applied for citizenship many, many years ago, um, one of the tests was tuberculin test, and I was positive. So next step is to go through radiography. And on radiography, even if it is for any other reason, there is any suspicion of any lesion, then you go on isoniazid. One of our children had to be put on isoniazid because they were born in the uh, UK and um, 
they were immunized in childhood against tuberculosis. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, in this class, actually, I've had people who are positive. Okay, those who come from India, Pakistan, or Eastern Europe. They have. All right, so tuberculosis, that's why it's in red. It is not used in this country. That's the only bacterial vaccine used, and it, but it is used in Eastern European and Asian countries. Okay. I uh, killed whole organism. Poliovirus. Now, that is the preparation that is used. That's also referred to as sock vaccine. And the live one is referred to as Sabin. Okay? Those are named after people who um, sort of produce them. Influenza, I already told you about. The kill vaccine in the elderly and at risk. <clears throat> Okay, um, rabies, post-exposure, that's again a killed vaccine. Um, Q fever, you will not hear about it anymore. Dr. Mayer will talk about that. Typhoid, cholera, plague, again in endemic areas where you're traveling. People who are in Peace Corps or who are uh, going for some um, flood relief where the cholera becomes an uh, epidemic, um, they are given those. Um, Pertussis vaccine, that is now, it used to be whole organism. And in some countries, they may still use it. But now there is a subcellular, acellular fraction, uh, acellular preparation that is used. Okay, those are the whole organism. Microbial fragments, Bordetella pertussis, I already told you. Uh, when I talk about pert uh, pertussis as a organism as a disease. There's a separate lecture for it. I'll talk about what components are used as a vaccine. But there are some bacterial components. <clears throat> um, Haemophilus influenzae. It used to be a polysaccharide vaccine, but now it is a conjugated vaccine, polysaccharide and protein conjugate. The advantage is that you, the, the sugars or carbohydrate serves as a haptin. If you remember Dr. Mayer's lecture, haptins, and then when they are conjugated with the protein, they produce a good T-dependent immune response, and they um, produce immunological memory as well. So that's a long-term protection. The disadvantage of using just polysaccharide was, what's the characteristic of polysaccharide as an antigen? T-independent. What else, uh, when there is a response, what type of response there is? Primary, each time, like primary, what's the characteristic of primary response? Mostly IgM. Okay, so mostly IgM. No immunological memory. Okay, no long-term protection. But now, most carbohydrate, most polysaccharide vaccines are being used as a conjugate of polysaccharide protein. Okay, uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, again, the same thing. <coughs> polysaccharide is the protective antigen, but it is conjugated to a protein. Uh, and I see how many it is, polysaccharide, but they are coming up with, they have come up with polysaccharide uh, uh, conj protein conjugate for that as well. So most of these polysaccharide vaccines subcomponents are being used as polysaccharide protein conjugate. Okay, so those were the fragments. Uh, some more fragments, Clostridium tetani, tetanus toxoid. That's the, you know, the one that you will um, read in your POPs exercise. Um, Cronibacterium diphtheriae, and then you get toxoid. Um, Vibrio cholerae, toxin subunit. Whenever it is used, whoever, uh, hepatitis B virus, it's a clone vaccine. Okay, so those, those are the uh, fragments. Just to explain to you what toxoid is really, how it, what the basic principle of it, that's a ugly looking, ferocious toxin that will kill you. Chemical certain, and some of these moieties are toxin, okay? And the other, of course, there are lots of immunogenic, antigenic molecules there, too. By um, treating with chemicals, certain chemicals, 
one can modify this toxin so that it does not have a toxin-like effect, and it remains immunogenic, and of course there are other immunogenic determinants as well, and it becomes a nice friendly immunogen for immunization. There are other future vaccines that are very different and very uh, much, uh, you know, uh, other, uh, comes under the category of other vaccines. If you remember an idiotype, Dr. when Dr. Mayer was talking about, it is a sort of mirror image of the antibody, okay? And certain anti-idiotypic antibodies can act as an antigen. They can stimulate T cells and B cells to produce an immune response. Um, DNA vaccine, the, <clears throat> the protein, the, the gene for the proteins that are used for immunization, that's of course the DNA, can be injected into the skin and by just sheer force of injection, the way it is applied, it can get into some cells. And once it gets into the cells, it can get incorporated into the host DNA, it can be transcribed, translated, and the host itself is producing that protein. Okay? And, of course, the advantage is since it's produced by the host itself, it's inside the host cells, both Th1 and Th2 responses will occur cell-mediated as well as antibody-dependent. It is not approved for usage. It is not being used clinically. There's a lot of experimentation with it. There are lots of problems with it as well. So uh, it may be sometimes in the future that you will see it if you do. Immunodominant peptide, if you remember Dr. McCallop's lecture, the T cells respond to certain peptides. Those are referred to as immunodominant peptides, and of course they are being used either by themselves or in association with tetramers of MHC, so that they are presented directly to the T cells. Okay? Again, they are not in clinical usage as a routine vaccine. Those are the future vaccines. Now, here is in your handout I have given, don't memorize it, just look at it, that there are different schedules, different timing for each immunization. This is published in MMWR, which is a nice place to consult for all sorts of bacteria, infectious diseases, as well as other things. Um, and, um, uh, well, actually last night I was looking at many, many cases of um, um, oh, um, plague, plague cases, five, six cases of plague. When I talk about Yersinia, you'll see some of those cases. So uh, it's a useful resource for you. Um, this changes. This is likely to change every year, Not does not necessarily change, there are some changes every year. For example, hepatitis A now is part of the schedule. It used to be only in certain states and people at high risk. Okay? So don't memorize it, but just be familiar with what are the live vaccines, okay, and what are the uh, heat kill vaccines. Know those because that, that is a, an important fact to remember. Okay? Um, no treatment is without effect. All immunizations, all of you have been immunized with one or the other and all the routine immunization. How many of you have had a reaction to it? Low-grade fever, aches, pains, okay? Soreness at the site of injection, okay? So there are serious side effects. And I'm just going to give you some uh, things that that is mostly with the DPT, those figures, but uh, because of having pertussis as part of it, that had created a lot more, a lot more serious side effects than other vaccines. A redness, swelling, 
one, to two, one in two to three doses. So it's very frequent, redness and swelling, uh, particularly after the booster. Um, systemic, mild, moderate fever, drowsiness, uh, fretfulness, uh, uh, one in two to three doses, anorexia in five to 15 doses. Um, systemic, more serious, persistent crying fever, one in 100 to 300. Don't have to memorize it, just giving you some perspective, okay? There are side effects of all vaccines. Um, so th that is all for immunization lecture. Um,